Okay, let's get straight into malignant hyperthermia. Right, a very severe reaction we need to be aware of. Triggered by specific anesthesia drugs. That's the main cause, yes. And the hallmarks are, what, rapid temperature increase? Definitely key feature, along with muscle rigidity. And a really fast heart rate, too. Yes, tachycardia often presents early. Fundamentally, it's an inherited skeletal muscle issue. Inherited, okay, so it runs in families. Correct. We call it malignant hyperthermia susceptibility, or MHS. It stems from a gene mutation. And the gene most often involved is RYR1. That's the primary one, yes. Though others can be involved. So the mechanism, it's about uncontrolled calcium release. Exactly. Within the skeletal muscle cells. Which leads to that sustained muscle contraction. Right. The muscles just can't relax. And that's used through ATP energy stores. It does. ATP gets depleted and overall metabolic activity just skyrockets. When do these symptoms typically appear during the procedure? They can, yes. Or sometimes it might be delayed, appearing postoperatively. Common signs to watch for. Severe muscle stiffness. That's a big one. Or spasms, often quite pronounced. And breathing difficulties. Yes. Typically rapid and shallow breathing. You'll see oxygen levels drop. And carbon dioxide levels rise. Correct. High-end tidal CO2 is often one of the earliest signs. Cardiovascular effects. We mentioned the fast heart rate. Tachycardia, yes. And potentially irregular rhythms, too. Arrhythmias can develop. And the temperature. It can get dangerously high. Extremely high, yes. Uh -huh. Hyperthermia is the defining feature, though it might be a later sign. You might also see excessive sweating. Mm -hmm. And sometimes patchy skin color. Modeling can occur. Are there other rarer triggers besides anesthesia? There are. Things like really intense physical activity, especially in heat and humidity. Interesting. Viral illness, too. Possibly. And there have been some reports implicating certain statin medications, although that's less common. So how do you confirm the diagnosis? Is there a definitive test? The gold standard has been the caffeine halothane contracture test, the CHCT. That involves muscle biopsy, right? Yes. You need a fresh skeletal muscle sample. It tests the muscle's reaction to caffeine and halothane. What about genetic testing? That's increasingly used. It looks for mutations in known causative genes like RYR1, Kekano1S, and STAC3. Is genetic testing always feasible? Well, it can be expensive, and access isn't universal yet. So often, a high degree of clinical suspicion based on the signs and symptoms is absolutely vital for making a timely diagnosis. Okay, so you suspect MH. What's the immediate treatment? Dantrolene. Intravenous dantrolene right away. That's number one. And stop the triggering anesthetic agent immediately. Absolutely. Turn off the volatile anesthetics. Stop the succinylcholine. Then hyperventilate the patient. Yes, with 100% oxygen. Flush out the inhaled agents and manage the high CO2. And switch to safe, non-triggering anesthetics if the surgery must continue. Correct. Use intravenous agents like propofol, opioids, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants if needed, TVA, total intravenous anesthesia, is the way to go. And finish the surgery as quickly as is safely possible. Yes, wrap it up promptly. What about supportive care beyond dantrolene? Active cooling is essential to bring down that high body temperature. Cooling blankets, cold IV fluids, even gastric lavage with cold water if needed. Need to correct the metabolic chaos too. Acidosis. Yes. Treat the acidosis usually with sodium bicarbonate based on blood gas results. Address hypoxemia as well. And manage any cardiac arrhythmias. Right. Follow standard ACLS protocols, but avoid calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers are contraindicated. Yes. They can worsen hyperkalemia and cause cardiovascular collapse in this setting. Amiodarone or lidocaine are preferred for ventricular arrhythmias. And maintaining kidney function is critical. Very important. Aim for a urine output of at least 2 milliliters per kilogram per hour. The dantrolene formulation actually helps here. How so? Each vial of dantrolene Revanto contains 3 grams of mannitol, which promotes urine flow. Rhinodex, the newer formulation, has less mannitol but still requires attention to hydration and output. If it's not treated quickly, the complications can be severe. Extremely severe. Rhabdomyolysis is a major concern. Muscle breakdown, releasing damaging substances. Exactly, which can lead directly to kidney damage or outright kidney failure. Acute renal failure is a serious risk. What else? Blood clotting issues. Yes. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, can occur, mm. leading to both clotting and bleeding problems. And potential brain damage from hypoxia or ischemia. That's a risk, as are cardiac arrest and heart failure. Pulmonary edema, too. 
Fluid in the lungs. Yes. And even skeletal muscle degeneration longer term. Ultimately, death is a very real possibility if not managed aggressively. So prevention is key for susceptible individuals. How do you identify them? Asking about family history is paramount. Any family members with MH, any unexplained deaths or severe complications related to anesthesia. So patients need to report this history. Absolutely. Inform the surgeon and especially the anesthesiologist well before any procedure requiring anesthesia. And the anesthesiologist can then avoid the known triggering drugs. Precisely. They'll use safe, non-triggering alternatives. There are plenty of options available. Is pretreatment with dantrolene ever recommended? Generally, no. It used to be considered, but current guidelines don't recommend routine pretreatment for MHS patients if known triggers are avoided. How common is MH, actually? It's considered rare. Estimates vary, but roughly 1 in 100,000 anesthetic administrations in adults. And in children? It's thought to be more frequent in children, maybe around 1 in 30,000 anesthetics. But even with its rarity, the potential severity means we always need to be prepared. With prompt diagnosis and proper treatment, especially dantrolene. The outcome is much better. Yes, the mortality rate has dropped significantly. It's now estimated to be around 3 to 5% with current management protocols, down from maybe 70 or 80% historically. Let's recap some early warning signs clinicians should watch for. Often, the very first signs are an unexpected rise in end tidal carbon dioxide that doesn't respond to increased ventilation. Right, hypercapnia. And unexplained tachycardia, a fast heart rate. Sometimes you might see masseter or muscle rigidity, spasm of the jaw muscles after succinylcholine. Yes, MMR, masseter muscle rigidity, can be an early sign, although it doesn't always progress to full-blown MH. But it definitely warrants close observation and possibly aborting the procedure. And it's important to consider other conditions that might look similar. Absolutely. The differential diagnosis is important. You need to rule out things like neuroleptic malignant syndrome, although that's usually related to antipsychotic drugs. What else? Thyroid storm, sepsis, pheochromocytoma, heat stroke, other causes of hypermetabolism, and hyperthermia. Okay, so after the initial crisis is controlled with dantrolene, what next? You need to continue the dantrolene. The standard recommendation is one milligram per kilogram intravenously every four to six hours. And so long. Usually for at least 24 hours, sometimes up to 48 hours, depending on the patient's stability. You have to watch for recurrence. While continuing to monitor urine output closely, still aiming for that two milliliters per kilogram per hour. Yes. Maintain good hydration and monitor urine output keeping the mannitol content of the dantrolene formulation in mind regarding fluid balance. It sounds like quick recognition and fast treatment are everything. They really are. Better outcomes are directly linked to how quickly MH is suspected and how fast that first dose of dantrolene is administered. And even after stabilization, close monitoring is needed. Definitely. Patients should be monitored in an intensive care unit setting for at least 24 hours. Why? risk of recurrence. Exactly. Relapse or recurrence can happen even after initial successful treatment. Is the risk higher for certain patients? Yes. Patients with a larger muscle mass seem to be at higher risk for recurrence. Also, those who had a longer exposure to the triggering anesthetic agent before MH was recognized, say, over 150 minutes. Finally, given the genetic basis, family education must be crucial. Extremely important. Once a person is diagnosed as MHS, their blood relatives need to be informed because they have a 50% chance of inheriting the susceptibility. They should be advised about testing and informing their own healthcare providers. So vigilance and communication are key, both in the operating room and within families. Absolutely, that's the take home message. Be prepared, act fast, and follow through with family counseling.